about J. I thought, brain or J? Brain or J, is it exclusive? But yeah, it's completely exclusive. Yes. <laughs> welcome, welcome all. What a pleasure. Um, I will talk about the brain, I promise. Oops. Everybody's expecting me to tell stories about J. No way. <laughs> I'm a very bad storyteller. Um, now, it's true, we grew up together and I know everything. And if anybody wants to know anything about Jay, ask me. I know. I'm not going to say anything yet, but I know it all. And, and we really grew up together. Uh, I think we went into the army same year. It was a mess. Israel was just after the uh, Yom Kippur War. The army was a mess. We were a mess. Three years of a mess. We came out. We went to study. It was a mess. Physics in Jerusalem, a mess. Come on, you know. No. <laughs> so after three years, we both went into Weizmann, the place for physics, by the way. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Sorry. And did our master's together, and we both landed. We didn't know each other. Or we had seen each other. Landed in, in uh, the master's, and we were told, you go to the student's dorm, and you share a dorm. Hmm? Share a dorm? Why? With who? And then they said, it's this guy who's also from Jerusalem. You must know him. <laughs> no, never met him. Actually, we did meet once, but for a brief period, they stole our bikes because we tied them together. Different story. <laughs> and then for a year, I was stuck in this room with Jay. We were solving. This is, you know, the quantum leap in, in physics in Jerusalem is with the first year of physics, you're really studying very hard, and they give you the most, the toughest integrals over we learned what the Green's function was. Oh, that was terrible in nuclear physics. And uh, slowly we evolved and understood that indeed this was a, a decent thing to do. We might even call ourselves physicists at one point. And then came a war. <coughs> so after the first year, I think, suddenly we had to go to the army again. And we were stuck in this godforsaken place up in Lebanon, each one in his different uh, uh, region. And we had to think, what do we do now? Where do we go? What do I do with our lives? Do we go study? And yes, we came back and studied. Completely unintelligible. Went back into the same place. We went into elementary particles, which was the thing. You know, in Jerusalem, you learn the quantum mechanics. That's, that's the lady. That, that's where the aesthetics is. That's where elegance is. And we both understood that elementary particles is the place to realize this. Jay in, in uh, uh, theory, I was an experimentalist. And for a year, we spent doing our relative work in a master's degree. And this is Jay's result. <laughs> this is what a year of, I mean, the man knew his Gaussian integrals, you can see. <laughs> and I remember sitting for one day and, you know, we're looking at, he has these horrible pages on pages on pages of scribbling. And where's the mass? It's a monopole. Where's his mass? And there's an exponent somewhere, and Jay says, you know, Yukawa, maybe we relate the exponent. And he had a mass. And therefore, there was a paper. And it came out, and then we both realized, time to leave elementary particles. <laughs> Which we both did. We went in this little, little room, <coughs> empty. Victor was there. He was sitting in the small office in the side. There was really nothing there. And the guy shows you pictures of convection. <sighs> so beautiful. You know, suddenly you see there's a little bit beyond this. I was in a group of maybe 200 people in Hamburg working on, on some particle, and Jay was deep in his scribbles of her scribbles. And there's also some beauty which is related to the real world, and we both were captivated, and from then on, <coughs> we've been working uh, more or less in proximity for about four years, five years. Um, You'll notice that this is his first paper, this is his second paper. You might have noticed this is what uh, 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 Bauch showed uh, a few minutes ago. And right after this, there was a transition, and Jay and I worked on binary mixtures for the rest of the time. But this is really a place where you could see you know, the, the uh, science of Jay coming out. So this is, I, I tell you, you know, turbulent front was not very interesting. What was interesting is that Günther Ahlers had measured this and got the wrong number. <laughs> That's what you wanted to see. So he had measured this and got 1.2, I think, 1.6. Victor knows. I don't remember. So there was a result. The number is 2. We know it has to be true. 2. Marginal stability criterion. 
Aronson and Weinberger, I think, showed it has to be two. Why isn't it two? And in fact, Jay did the experiment. This is a, a convection. So you have heating on one side, and then you get rolls, pre uh, uh, ro rolls prepared and begun here, and then you jump into the state where it's convective, and this propagates into the convective state. And if you do the experiment exp uh, uh, carefully enough and well enough, then you measure a velocity, and the velocity, as you can see, has a nice dependence on the control parameter, and you extract a velocity which, surprise, surprise, is precisely two. And I remember this conference where Victor talks about this, and then somebody asks, uh, Gunter, could you explain why you think this is not, uh, why, why Victor got two and you got uh, one point something? And Gunter says, Victor is a good experimentalist. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> so th the way we lived was there was this one room. Victor had a small office on the side. And we shared a, a uh, not a bunk bed, but <coughs> a, an optical table. And there was a line across the middle. And one side was a holy mess. Really, you know, I was asked to talk about Jay's motorcycle. His side of the, is like his motorcycle. Clunky, cluttery, noisy. If you've lost anything in the lab, look for it. On the, it's somewhere in this mess. <laughs> you can find it there. But you find out that you can still do very good physics, even within this holy mess. Okay, that was a lesson for me. Uh, coming from my German origins, you know, everything has to be in place. You know, I have the tea ready there. This was in place five minutes before the time, right? <coughs> we grew up a bit differently, but still you can do physics like this and like this. Uh, in fact, 10 years after this, I re uh, came back to this experiment when we were looking at membranes, and these are highly flexuating. This is a bit of science, sorry, it's not. This is uh, uh, fluctuating, and if you heat this very gently or, or bring a laser here, then you can start, uh, I don't know if you see it here, you can start a propagation of these little instabilities which evolve into something which we call pearls. And once you realize this is a dynamic instability and it's a nonlinear one, then you go back to Jay's result here and you say, actually, the biggest thing of this marginal stability analysis is that you don't care how nonlinear you are. In fact, if you look only at the front, only at the very initial part of this propagation, it's still linear. And the properties of that linear front are what determines both the wave number selection and the velocity. And therefore, you don't care what kind of mess you have behind. What determines this velocity is this linear analysis, as well as the wavelength. And we utilize that to measure the velocity in our case. <coughs> you can see we were not quite as clean. And the fluctuations are a bit larger. But you also get something that you can actually uh, uh, analyze pretty well in that case. And there were immediately three groups in the world which ran to calculate this and to do all the uh, simulations, which was a sign that it was time to leave. Okay? Uh, and we went on from, at least my lab moved on, from soft physics where nothing lives to a world where things are a bit more alive and a bit more interesting because if this kind of instability gets the, the, the uh, uh, attention of everybody, then truly it's a sign that uh, twilight is near. Uh, and we went on. We went on to biology. And in biology, <coughs> you can disrupt a cell. So this is how a cell looks once you've broken its... Uh, uh, the part which binds to all of the, the uh, surface. And you can see here that you get the same kind of pearls. And this kind of analysis allowed us to give some numbers into biology and to, for example, calculate the Young modulus of the cell itself to identify something about the thickness of a, a cortex, a, a sort of a, a layer which preserves the, the uh, stiffness of the cell and uh, other... other uh, <coughs> Uh, numbers which would be interesting for a biologist, but only if he wanted to do some quantitative uh, experiment. All right, <coughs> enough of stories. Let's use the remaining five minutes to talk about uh, nerves, neurons. Now, we're not in a rush anywhere, 
So if you have questions, stop me. I have lots of slides, as many as you want. There's one part about time, one part about space. We can do all that. But if you have questions, much more interesting. Okay? So we're going to talk about neurons. It's what we do in the lab. We're looking at computation in general, but the thing that an experiment would like to have in hand is the actual neuron. And the neuron is built, like all things army-wise, but of an input, an output, and a CPU, something which uh, uh, calculates. And what it calculates is the inputs from its neighbors. There's a connection between the neighbors. The connection is uh, mod uh, mediated by a synapse. You have something coming in from one side, a signal, which is electrical. It's a, 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 a potential, an action potential, which is created here, propagates down and reaches the synapse. The connection here is mediated here by a chemical, which is sent over a very small gap, picked up by the uh, receiver, the receiving neuron, and creates very small uh, fluctuations in the voltage of this one. If enough accumulate here, then it will pass the threshold for an action potential, and this one will fire and continue on to the next ones. So input, then writes, output, axon, CPU, soma, cell, all right? Why does it go from electricity to chemistry? Because that's what we are. You know, we are chemistry. We're not the electricity. Electricity is very deterministic. All our moods, all our, everything is, is uh, dominated by regulating the transmission here. All the, <coughs> all the modulation occurs at the synapses, learning occurs at the synapses. This is where actually our, where, where we are. The caffeine you took, anything like that, uh, it has to do with changing the activity here. Uh, we'll also, some of the experiments I'll show you exactly determine how if you take away calcium, then you don't allow release of these vesicles, these transmitters. If you block the receivers here, the receptors here, then you can also change the connectivity. And that's how we would go in to a network and actually change the, the behavior of this network and the connections between the, the different uh, areas. What we do is actually we have the mom come in once a week to the lab. She donates her pups. The pups from the pups, we take the brain. The uh, brain is dissociated into neurons. We take the hippocampus, which is an area dedicated to memory. Uh, it's a well-known, well-characterized well, well region and we plate it and since they've already differentiated into neurons they know they have to connect they're ready to send their their uh, um, uh, dendrites and axon out and they send it and they find each other and connect and within uh, let's say uh, from the plating within a week we have a culture which is active and within 10 or 14 days we actually measure it this is how we we work we try to isolate the neurons so they don't uh, uh, so, so we can identify which one fired and how. But you can also get very large aggregates like this if you take regions from different areas of the brain. And then you would have fasciculated many axons connecting, which is also an interesting system on its own. This is just what we measure. This is the kind of activity. You'll see this is an image of all the neurons. They, are, they have a calcium dye inside of them. This is the raster of what is going on. You'll see they all fire together, notice they fire together, and soon you'll get another occurrence, it's a bit speeded up, so you'll see all these, they have the calcium, they have the, uh, the fluorescence dye inside, once the calcium, once calcium goes in because they fire, then <coughs> the fluorescence is changed and you see this activ activation. So, back here, this is the setup we have, the <coughs> neurons are growing in a dish, we are imaging them with fluorescence, and we can also activate them with a, a voltage which we put on them. But in general, we're imaging either the uh, fluorescence like here or the activation with, the, with, the, uh, uh, with the electrodes. Questions? We'll run them. Now, some say the brain is critical. Our brain, the one we have here, a brain, the brain we're looking at, not critical. Not critical at all. <coughs> our brain here may be very, very complicated, very different. It may be critical, it may have some behavior which is, which is, you can measure power loss, but the criticality we've not seen. So when we look at this brain, at our brain, it is not critical, why? Because if you take it in the right uh, conditions, if you look at our uh, dish, you saw these many neurons connecting together, 
what they do is they fire pretty regularly and most of them fire, all right? So if you ask how many neurons are firing under the right conditions, you see that it's pretty regular and if you look as uh, into uh, uh, in detail, then you see that indeed you get nice oscillations. These bursts have a nice characteristic time scale. If you change the conditions and you put antibiotics or some kind of uh, messy medium, you can really mess it up, all right? So this is a nice oscillator which you can mess up considerably and people have measured many things uh, related to the statistics of these firing. So you can mess it up and then maybe you get something interesting, but as it is what we're looking at, oscillators. Uh, and we can characterize, you know, if you look at this oscillator, how well defined is this frequency and you can see that in most cases, these are three different samples, uh, you get uh, nice bursts which have a reasonable uh, uh, probability distribution of the interburst interval which defines the frequency. So there's a characteristic time scale. It's a long time scale, that's the funny thing. And when we try to understand what this time scale is for the bursting, well, it turns out that it's really related to the dynamics of the single neuron, but that's hard to, hard to evaluate. So what we do is, first we uh, go to a different way of imaging. Here these white things are the cells, they're growing on electrodes, and you're looking at here maybe you had initially 60 electrodes, and maybe 10 of them are dead, so you see spikes from about 50 or 55 uh, electrodes. That's more or less what we can do. And each one has a neuron near it, and that's the neuron that it's measuring more or less all the time, and these are the spikes that we're getting. And you ask, what is it doing? So we look back, and under the regular conditions that we had before, you see everybody fires together. It's pretty normal. It's boring. This is not our brain. We would not like our brain to be like that. Everybody fires together, and they do it at a time scale which is long. Where is the time? Who made the slide? <laughs> All right, I don't know. <coughs> it, uh, so, so it should be about uh, 10. And there you go. 10 seconds. Good. Ah, there's the time scale. All right, thank you. <laughs> but, so, we said this is the, the, the behavior of all of them together, but we try and uh, uh, break up the, the system and we try to look at the individual neurons. And what you do is you add a blocker, a synaptic blocker, so you don't let them talk to each other and you look how they're uh, uh, firing when they're on their own. And the answer is they don't. Okay. If you put these blockers and you break down the network activity, they stop firing, which is surprising. All right? Why don't they fire? If they're firing together, why don't they fire alone, etc. But you see, there are a few ways of blocking this, and this blocker is one which blocks the connections between the neurons, the actual blocks the receptors. There are other ways to do this, and what we went for, for the next thing is to block this with changing the calcium concentration. And once you do that, then they can't talk to each other because the sender, there's, it's not the receiver which is blocked, but the sender can't actually send out his, uh, uh, the neurotransmitters. That's the, the, the vesicles are not, are not released. What we didn't realize, it, there's, a, there's a side effect of this, which is that the calcium also elevates slightly the voltage of the individual neurons, and they become a bit more excitable. All right? Once you do that, then the activity comes back. So at zero calcium, you've elevated a little bit, so you make them a bit more excitable, and suddenly they are all firing. And when you look at here, you see there's no bursting. There's no apparent frequency. But the whole culture, the culture as a whole, is active. And you see that this is a raster. There are a few neurons which are very active, a few which are less active. But in general, we've retrieved some of the activity. If we now put the blockers that we had before, in fact, nothing much happens, right? The blockers, we know that what they do is, is uh, block the, the uh, connectivity. Uh, if you look at the details, yes, there's a little bit of uh, reduction, which tells us that these are not, ver not completely specific. They don't do only blocking. They do a little bit more. All right, the big surprise is that when you look at the single neurons, there are also oscillators. Okay? If you look in detail, what we had before, but now the single neurons, they happen to oscillate as well which means that somehow we're getting all these oscillators completely disconnected. When you connect them, they're all oscillating together. 
Kuramoto, some kind of synchronization, what's going on? Yes, question. Do you have a sense of what the average um, connectivity is between neurons? That's the second part, which I will not get to. So we have about 100,000 neurons. If I see that a different, the, 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 uh, the variety of concentrations that I can get, it will go from about 40 connections per neuron to about 180. Highly connected, infinitely connected. Yes, exactly. And when they're so connected, then in fact it's enough for about two or three percent of the neurons to fire to get everybody firing in a percolation process. Is the, the largest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix underlying graph as a big role in the dynamics? Precisely. <laughs> Precisely. All right, but that's the second part of the talk, which I have no time to, unfortunately. All right, so what, what we're seeing here first is that they're well-defined. All these uh, uh, neurons oscillate, and they oscillate at nice frequencies, and the frequencies are again slow, all right? So you can look what happens as you uh, bring back the calcium, of course, you know, go gradually up in calcium, and from a completely disconnected, you get here what we had before, which is a fully disconnected, and in between you see that, you know, this large spike of all the synchronous firing builds up from something which is not quite synchronous. So the synchronicity, that really relies on the calcium. Uh, and you slowly get this uh, entrainment of all of these neurons into one large spike. And then there's some afterburst of uh, all of them. But it's interesting that in the meantime, the, there's a, a transition like this. Notice that the frequency changes, which is not at all a Kuromoto kind of uh, uh, scenario. And there's work by Strogatz, uh, you know, how to adapt the Kuromoto, which is a... Uh, sine wave, uh, 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 which are which are coupled to something which is actually uh, pulse coupled li like these neurons, and then that that kind of uh, treatment can get this kind of behavior of uh, of the uh, of the frequency as as you go into the fully synchronized mode. Uh, just one just one note about the transition. So the single neuron frequencies range from, you know, about 0.1 to maybe 2 hertz, large range, average over all of them, and you get what the frequency of the whole network will be afterwards. That's a little bit like in Kuomoto. So you're getting the average of all the available frequencies, and you see that here. So the difference between the oscillators and the uh, result of the, uh, uh, of the connection of all of them, you can see that it's very close uh, in, in terms of at least our experimental uh, resolution. All right. Let's forget that. Just say that we, we can probe uh, uh, the single neuron dynamics and ask where this time scale comes from. And it might come from leaks which go into the neuron, but that's, that's unrelated. Uh, maybe it tells us where, where this long time scale, you know, our clock, our CPU works at a kilohertz, one millisecond. That's the time scale for a a, an action potential, two to five milliseconds. Here we're getting time scales of seconds, 10 seconds. Where does that come from? And it seems to be a small leakage current which goes into these individual neurons and makes them fire. Which means that we're looking at an artificial system. A biologist may be interested in this, but in fact, what we're looking at is something that we've created. We're understanding this. And in fact, once you grow these neurons on, on the, on the uh, floor, so to speak, in a big medium, you can really understand everything. Um, I won't tell you about... <coughs> I, wo I won't tell you the details of this. I'll just say that when you look at space, now the whole picture becomes sort of more coherent. Because in space, you don't look at the single neuron, what they're doing. You ask how the connectivity is going to affect the firing of everybody together. And what you can do is you can break down completely the network. That's this response curve. Here we're asking how many of the neurons fire when we put a voltage across them. And the answer is that it's a Gaussian. You know, this is the integral of a Gaussian. And if you're looking at the single neuron responsiveness in space, you get a wide range. And some of them will fire at 2 volts. You know, this is an electric field. Not it's not the voltage which is important, but it's order of 100 volts per meter. That's what you're getting. And you get the full range as you go across. So this is a fully disconnected network. 
if you go to a fully connected network, this is what happens. It's enough to get a very small percentage on the order of 2%, you know that from integrating this, 2 to 3% and everybody fires. And that means that in this case, they're so highly connected that everybody will fire and that's how we actually get the propagation. And in between, of course, you get this large uh, component showing up which is uh, responsible for, for the percolation process. All right. 1215, thank you very much. Yes. <coughs> Maybe you already told that, but I also would miss this. Do you have idea why it happens very glad? So they become connected, and now when one fires, all the others know about it. And now there's a small group which is highly connected, and probably they're the ones to be more sensitive to, uh, to firing of other neurons. So this is just a thought. You have leaders. You have uh, uh, more sensitive neurons dispersed everywhere. If they have enough con connections to other neurons, they will go beyond their threshold before. So you have a small percentage, two or three percentage. They will fire first. They're so connected that everybody fires. How this connection comes about, that's a spatial process. It depends on the, the uh, changes in the connectivity that we're introducing with the calcium. Calcium allows more and more connections to be made. The weak connections remain low. As you're going higher and higher, they will come more prob probable to fire. So it's actually a per percolation process. So you think you hope they generate something? You told us that uh, everything is basically in chemistry. And electricity, but yes. We are chemistry. In, in our in humans. Yes. Right? Now, you are doing experiments in a certain environment. Yes. Now, who knows what is the environment in the real brain? Oh, right. Yes. For example, when you take some psychotic medicine. For example. Okay. So it's legal. You, can you actually <laughs> make conclusions from your experiments and go to our real brain? So notice, a brain. Not our brain, not the brain, a brain. In a dish. All right? Completely irrelevant for our brain. But is it really a brain? Okay. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> so it has no wishes of its own, right? It's it is completely brain. deterministic. It is completely deterministic. It does what we tell it to. In that sense, it's not a brain. Yeah, but more than that, you know, we know that the brain has glia and has all these things also interacting with the stuff, right? So, you know, is it the brain? Or is it just a bunch of oscillators that are doing whatever? At the moment, it is not a brain. I agree. It is <coughs> much more determinist. Not yet. It's the physics of a brain. <laughs> and you notice that if I change the fluid, you get a completely different response, right? I had to work hard to make it nice oscillators. Change a little bit and it becomes a mess. Add antibiotics, anything, it becomes a mess. So in that sense, it's a brain. It's a mess. <laughs> Sorry. Do you have a hysteresis to ramp up the, up the voltage and ramp down into the game? Yeah. We have a slight hysteresis, but... Uh, well, if you repeat it multiple times, I, I just want to... Yes. Completely, yes. Completely, yes. We have a small hysteresis because the, the, the neurons tire. Uh, they fire. In that sense, yes. But, but there should not be. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> Next question. So the answer, of course, you can do it. You cannot image. Imaging in 3D, that's a, pa that's a pain. Uh, at the moment, uh, that, that's a... Okay, last question. Slightly louder. Yeah. How to control the network. So once you put these down, they start searching for each other. It's a, it's a Gaussian probability to hit neighbors. They send their axon far. And, you know, then it depends on the density of... Uh, uh, the targets, target neurons it meets, and the dendritic tree, the size of the dendritic tree. What we do is we confine the geometry, grow them on lines, grow them on circles. Very nice. So the axon propagates only along this line, and then you get directed motion, directed propagation of information. So that, that's what we can do. Limited again. What you engineer is what you get. At the moment, we have not yet achieved something which is dynamic on its own. Interesting details, but we can discuss. We do it. Thank you.